Hey everybody, welcome to Boulder Creek Community Church Online. My name is Adam, I'm one of the pastors there, and if this is your first time tuning in, I want to welcome you. Thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to this message. For those of you who are not aware, we do have live services outside, and we will do that through October, weather permitting. We have two services where we're able to social distance, and so you can come at 9 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. Uh, to be a part of that. Now, we've got some things coming up the week of October 19th. I don't want you to miss out on some of these opportunities, but we are going to be uh, relaunching old Bible studies and launching new ones. I'm hoping that women's Bible studies, men's Bible studies, mixed Bible studies, online Bible studies, as well as Celebrate Recovery uh, will begin the week of October 19th. And so please reach out and contact me um, all of my information is on the website. You can go to bccchurch.org. That's bccchurch.org. And again, all of my contact information is at our website. You can also give online if you would like to uh, on our website. You can click the link that has Easy Tithe, and you can give toward three different things. One of them being Operation Feed the People. Uh, another one being the CZU Fire Recovery. Uh, as well as our general fund. And so those of you who do give, I want to thank you. And uh, we do greatly appreciate your generosity and your gifts that uh, are literally helping dozens and dozens and dozens of people. And so um, let me say a prayer before we get into the message today. And I am so excited to talk about uh, these things today. So let's pray. God, thank you so much. And I pray for each person that is hearing this message, uh, whenever, wherever they are, God, and that it would touch their lives, encourage them, challenge them, um, and it would be just what they need to hear with what's going on in their lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we started a new series called Essentials, and it's really all about the essentials of living the Christian life. What does it mean to be a Christian? Uh, what are the essentials of living the Christian life? And what I said was, is that to be a Christian is, into, it is to enjoy life. God gives us this abundant life. He promises us a blessed life. And we're going to explore more what that means. But that blessed life, that a joyful life is lived in the context of three things. It is lived in the context of relationship with Jesus, and we talked about that last week, but it is also in the context of living life with others. And then next week we'll hit the third part of that, which is for others. Uh, let me nerd out on you just for a few minutes. I want to read some quotes from some different resources. Um, and so hang in there. It might get a little heady, might get a little... Uh, thick, but stay with me, and hopefully there'll be some reward for that. Sebastian Younger, some of you maybe heard of him. He's an American author and journalist, and a few years ago, he came out with a New York bestseller. It's called Tribe, and this book is about life on the eastern seaboard back in the 1800s as Europeans were settling in the Americas. And so you had two groups of people. You had the indigenous people who lived like they had lived for perhaps thousands of years. And then you had the European colonists, most of them British at that time, and they were living at the apex of Western civilization. But here's what's interesting, and this is done through a lot of research and a lot of documents that date back to the time. A number of colonists began to defect and go and live among the Indians. But what was odd was, is that there were no records of indigenous people defecting to live among civilized Europeans. Back in 1753, Ben Franklin wrote a letter to a friend. He said of the colonists who were captured in a raid and then later saved and brought back to the colony, and this is his quote, though ransomed by their friends and treated with all imaginable tenderness, to prevail with them to stay among the English, yet in a short time they became disgusted with our manner of life and take the first good opportunity of escaping again into the woods. In other words, these folks wanted to live off the grid. 
a Frenchman back in 1782 uh, quotes, thousands of Europeans are Indians. And we have no examples of even one of those Aborigines having from choice become European. And here's his explanation. There must be in their social bond something singularly captivating and far superior to anything to be boasted among us. There was a study done by a Canadian psychologist on the London Blitz of 1940 and 1941. And this is what he found. Very bizarre uh, discovery. The rates of depression actually went down during the Nazi bombardment. In fact, they were concerned because one of the things the government did was to provide these bomb shelters all over the place for people to come together. And they were very afraid that people impacted in these bomb shelters would go crazy and begin to hurt each other. In fact, they found the very opposite. After the war, depression rates actually went back to normal levels. And here was the interpretation of this psychologist. It was a sense of community, a sense of belonging. They put down their differences politically and whatever else, religiously especially, and it brought people together. But since then, we saw this happen in America, too, during World War II. It brought us together. 9-11 brought us together for a short period of time. But since then, individualism has run rampant. One of the core values of American society is this rugged individualism. And a lot has been written on this, and I won't get heavier into the weeds on that. But here's what it has produced. It has actually produced a great sense of of loneliness that is pandemic in Western societies. We've heard the stats before. Since the 1950s, church attendance is cut in half. Half of what it was 70 years ago in our country. But not just churches, any and all forms of community that required commitment from, for example, country clubs, elk clubs, even the loyal order of water buffaloes bowling leagues, all of these have been on the decline since the 1950s. And here's where we're at now in Western societies. A lot of research done uh, in England on this issue. In fact, it was only a few years ago, the Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May, appointed, get this, a loneliness minister. Someone to oversee and come up with a plan for the loneliness that was pandemic in London. More than 9 million people, according to their research, in Great Britain often or always feel lonely. Far too many, she says, uh, far too many uh, loneliness, for far too many, loneliness is the sad reality of the modern life. Another researcher, Mark Robinson, uh, did some research on Britain's largest charity um, who works with elderly people. This is what he says. He warned that loneliness would kill people. In fact, it is proven worse by many different sources uh, to be worse for your health than smoking two-thirds of a pack of cigarettes a day, every day. One of the former United States Surgeon Generals, a guy named Dr. Vivek Murthy, he wrote an article for the Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago, and he argued that loneliness needed addressing in the workplace. Isn't that interesting? Uh, not retired people, not widows or widowers, not people living alone, but people actually working in the workplace. He says during his years in caring for patients, the most common pathology that he saw was not diabetes or heart disease, but loneliness. In fact, loneliness can be associated, he says, with a greater risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, depression, and anxiety. And even George Gallup, has reported that Americans are among the loneliest people 
in the world, and even more so among our elderly. Now, that's all pre-COVID. That's before this incredibly crazy year of 2020. Since then, think about it, COVID-19, shelter in place, a plunging economy, thousands upon thousands, millions of jobs lost, racial tension, and then our little part of the world, the CZU fires, and then coming up soon in just about a month, in fact, a month from today as I record this, may be one of the most hostile, divisive uh, elections in American history. And so what we're finding out is that all of this, all of our attempts to preserve ourselves, to stay healthy, to not get COVID-19, has produced some very stark uh, and, and frightening results. In fact, uh, what's happening is, is suicide and deaths by despair or deaths of despair have skyrocketed, meaning people who have overdosed, alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, abuse in the home. It has all increased incredibly in every city across America. In fact, one doctor of the John Muir Medical Center of Walnut Creek, California, just in our backyard here, claimed that in his facility where he works, that he has seen a year's worth of suicide attempts in the last four weeks. So, welcome to church. How you doing? Uh, I hope you're still there. I hope you're still tuned in. And I promise you, I don't think this message will cause you to, to have despair or become depressed. There is hope, but stay with me. Now, I want you to see what happens next. In our rugged, individualistic Western society that we pride ourselves in, here's the catch. It tends to lead to loneliness, and loneliness inevitably, according to research, all across the board, leads to a mental breakdown. Think of a recluse. It actually leads to mental illnesses. Or, if it doesn't lead to isolation and mental illness, here's where it leads to. Again, this is loneliness. It leads to tribalism. And I see it happening all across our country. Tribalism, I like the way one person describes it, it's community's evil twin. What's the difference? The difference between tribalism and what I would call a biblically healthy community. See, tribalism is about people coming together because of a mutual hate for someone or something. Whereas community is people coming together because of a mutual love for someone or something. Tribalism is all about what you're against, whereas community is all about what you are for. Tribalism, and here's, don't miss this, tribalism forces people to conform, to be like, think like, and act like, and look like one another. Think in our current cultural context, the Black Lives Movement organization. This is not against black lives. Trust me, this is about the organization BLM and critical race theory. It is conform or you are an enemy. Whereas biblical community especially actually celebrates differences. And what makes America great is not our differences. We've always been different. But what makes a community great, or a country great, or a church great, is our unity even in the midst of our differences. And so, the goal of the Christian life, as I said at the beginning, is to enjoy life with Jesus, with others, and for others. And last week we hit pretty hard on this idea of being with Jesus. And we talked about the story of Mary and Martha, and how Mary took the time to sit at the feet of Jesus, to be with Him. Whereas Martha was going crazy, she was serving Jesus, but she did not want to be with Jesus. And she was being torn apart inwardly, 
in her life. But secondly, and equally as important as the first point, is that not only are we invited to be with Jesus, we are invited to be with Jesus and others. Now think about it, the greatest commandment, and a lot of you know this, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment of all? He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But then he threw in a caveat. And the second one is like it. To love your neighbor. To love one another. See, you cannot become the person that Jesus is inviting you to become. And, and let's face it, the person that you really want to become as well. You cannot become that person not only without Jesus, but you cannot become that person without living in community. And that means not only just being around other people, but living in community with other people who are even different than you and who think differently than you. See, God calls us to love others, not issues. He calls us to love one another, not issues. Now, let me show you, show you a little bit more about what I mean. And if you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verses, uh, we'll start in verse 18. I, I love this. This is beautiful. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was also called Peter, and his brother Andrew. And they were throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Verse 19. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for men. Now, this is not Jesus just with a cheesy play on words, but this was a first century idiom. It meant this, that, that you will follow me and become like me. You will become a wise and influential person. This is an invitation of a lifetime for these two fishermen who were resigned to this career for the rest of their lives. And it was probably passed on to them by their father and their forefathers. They were these mostly uneducated fishermen who were getting the opportunity of lifetime. And that is to walk in the dust of Jesus. Verse 20 says, and what did they do? What was their response? They left their nets at once and followed him. Now, this is not like some of us might follow the Giants or the Niners. It's not like following Fox News or MSNBC. This is Jesus inviting them to be with him. Not just to be fans of Jesus, but to actually put on the uniform and play. Listen to this. In the Gospels, the invitation to follow is given at least 79 times. Well, Matthew goes on in verse 21. He says, uh, a little further up the shore, he saw two brothers, another pair of brothers, another pair of fishermen, James and John. And they were sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called to them to come too. And immediately, Matthew says, they followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. We have to go to the Gospel of John now, chapter 1, and we see what happens next. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And while he was leaving to go to Galilee, it says that he found Philip. And he said to him, follow me. And by the way, Nathanael was with him, and the both of them followed Jesus. And then if you go back to Matthew and you fast forward from chapter 4 to chapter 9. Now Matthew inserts himself in the story of Jesus. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. And so Matthew got up. And, and, and Scripture gives us such a minimalist uh, description of what happened, but you've got to think deeply about what this would have meant for Matthew to walk away from this very lucrative career, a, a career that gave him a lot of wealth uh, and a lot of prestige in certain circles in first century Israel. And he immediately got up and he followed them. And so not only is a Jesus invitation 
to be with Him. Not only is following Jesus an invitation to be with Jesus, but it is also, and don't miss this, it's an invitation to be with others. There is no I in following Jesus. There is no isolation. There is no reclusiveness when it comes to being a part of the movement of God here on earth. It goes on in chapter 9 of Matthew and verse 10. Later, Matthew invited Jesus. So Jesus invited Matthew to follow him. Matthew returns the favor and invites Jesus and his disciples, who are very suspicious of him at this time, I imagine, into his home, and underline this, as dinner guests. Along with, by the way, many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. Meaning, people who were ostracized from the religious community, which really ruled the country. And so, there were probably prostitutes and other businessmen who were shady, as well as the tax collectors who were traitors to their people. But, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples. I love this line. Why does your teacher, not our teacher, your teacher, eat with scum? And when Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. And then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. And he quotes Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. See, the Pharisees were really good about religious duty. They obeyed all the rules. They offered all the sacrifices they were supposed to offer. And Jesus quotes from the scriptures that they knew well, I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come not to call those who think they are righteous. And he's, he knows, the Pharisees know knows that he's talking about them, but rather those who know they are sinners. And so welcome to church, a place for scum, a place for sinners, a place for the sick, a place for the flawed, the imperfect, and the broken, just like you and me. One of my favorite names for churches of all times. And I heard about this church about 20 years ago. It's still there in downtown Denver. The name of the church, I love this, the scum of the earth. And it's a church that welcomes homeless people as well as people who drive up in their Mercedes from the suburbs. They eat together. They worship together. They love one another. Maybe my second favorite name for a church, and I've seen a couple of these. There's actually one out in Modesto area, and here's the name of that church. Not Your Grandmother's Church. I don't know what goes on inside, but I have a feeling they rock pretty loud. Now, I want you to think through this with me. I, I know I, I read through these scriptures pretty quick, but I want you to think through this with me. You have, first of all, these good uh, down-to-earth, mostly law-abiding fishermen. You have someone, his name is Nathaniel, who is considered by Jesus impeccable integrity. Then you have a tax collector who's literally on the payroll of the Roman Empire. They are considered traitors to their country on the level of prostitutes according to the cultural social order. Now, usually, wealthy and educated, they would buy a post, these tax collectors. They would collect taxes for the Roman government. And here's the caveat. They were allowed to, uh, to collect extra for themselves with the backing and the enforcement of Roman soldiers. And so you can see why they were considered traitors and why they were so hated by Jews. And then you add to this group of followers a guy named Judas Iscariot. Not Judas who betrayed Jesus. Um, actually, Judas who betrayed Jesus. Um, 
who is somewhat of a zealot. And then you have a guy named Simon who is literally called Simon the Zealot. Now, zealots were those guys who were God and country, but country came before God. They were the guys, not with MAGA hats, but with MEGA hats. Make Israel great again. And these guys were known to carry daggers. And if they had the opportunity and they got a Roman soldier that was alone, isolated for a period of time, they were known to take these daggers and try to kill some of the Roman soldiers. Their goal was to free Israel from the oppressive Roman Empire. Now, think about this group of followers. And I'm just talking about the 12, not the 100 plus, 150 plus so people that would have been with Jesus at some point or another during his years of ministry. But imagine the conversations in that group. Uh, I, I wonder what Matthew did when Jesus said, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Talking about paying taxes. I wonder what Matthew did uh, if he winked at Peter as Jesus taught them this. Uh, see, you couldn't get more. Uh, opposite, opposing, uh, extremely different people together on the same squad. Uh, it's like bringing Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders together on the same team. And so imagine, I did a little more thinking about this as I thought about this, imagine a white supremacist, skinhead, swastika tat right on his neck, a bisexual transgender, a black Antifa radical, throw into that mix a couple of blue-collar construction workers with MAGA hats, and throw in, just for fun, a Google engineer and, let's say, an Apple tech guy, just to round it off. See, that's what following Jesus can look like. It's people who might not have anything in common other than Christ. And so let's not miss the significance of this scene. You have tax collectors, you have fishermen, you have women, by the way, you have people who are of good report, and you have people that are disrep disreputable in society, prostitutes. And you have these dagger-carrying uh, zealots all coming together in a community of Jesus' followers. And, by the way, what were they doing at Matthew's house? And this is something that we so easily miss in Western culture. And Matthew makes special note of it. They were eating together. They were sitting down, drinking wine, and having a meal together. See, food in first century meant so much more than just nourishment. It was so much more than just driving through a drive through like Jack in the Box, just to, to fill your stomach for a little while. See, meals in the first century meant friendship. Meals meant you're welcome. Meals meant community. In fact, New Testament scholar Scott Barchi, he says this, It would be difficult to overestimate the importance of what he calls table fellowship. That is, sitting around with people, having a meal together. For the cultures of the Mediterranean basin in the first century of our era, meal times were far more than occasions for individuals to consume nourishment. Being welcomed at a table for the purpose of eating food with another person had become a ceremony richly symbolic of friendship, intimacy, and unity. Thus, betrayal or unfaithfulness, in particularly toward anyone with whom one had shared the table, was viewed as reprehensible. If you had a meal with someone, and they betrayed you that was considered extremely reprehensible. On the other hand, when persons were estranged, in disagreement, in some kind of uh, fight with one another, a meal invitation opened the way to reconciliation. 
Another New Testament scholar says this, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or leaving a meal. He has uh, eaten meals so often that he was accused, listen to this, of being a glutton and a drunkard. And another scholar says this, Jesus was crucified because of whom he ate with. And so your homework, church, here's your homework. Uh oh, I'm getting interrupted. Sorry. Hey. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. I had no idea anyone was in here. So. No. Uh, do you need help with something? I'm just recording my sermon oh, I'm for so Sunday. Oh, sorry. No, I'm that's Scott. okay. Scott, I'm Adam. Adam, nice to meet you. I'm the the pastor up at Boulder Creek, okay. and Michelle Whiting has kind of uh, arranged and allowed me to come okay. in there. So. Certainly, I'm so sorry to mess you up. Hopefully, you no, that's okay. Right I'll just. Pause. New Testament scholar Robert Karras says Jesus is either going to a meal at a meal, or leaving a meal. He was at meals so often he was actually accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. One other scholar says Jesus was crucified because of whom he ate with. Just the Gospel of Luke, just the Gospel of Luke, has 50 references to Jesus and food. Matthew 94. And so here's your homework, church. Here's your homework. Go eat with others. Go have a meal with others. Uh, enjoy time with friends, with family. Make new friends by having a meal. Now, obviously, uh, COVID-19, there's some limitations, some restrictions. Maybe you have to social distance, but I cannot underestimate or undervalue or undersay how critical and how important it is for you and I to be together with others around a table having a meal together. Now, maybe you can do that outside. Maybe you can do that through social distancing. But I, I imagine this, church. Imagine this. Imagine if visitors at our church were invited to lunch at least three times every time that they came to church. You know, this is not complicated. Uh, you know, we make excuses. We're too busy. You know, our home's a mess. Um, well, here's, here's what I want to encourage you with. Clean your home. <laughs> uh, who cares about how big your home is or how clean it is? Um, hospitality hospitality is so critical to to building friendships with one another uh, you're going to eat anyway uh, you're not going to skip a lot of meals unless you're fasting and so why not take some of those meals and have those meals with other people i never forget my first date with jennifer um, i made a meal along with my brother and his girlfriend at the time. I made a meal for her. Uh, I'll never forget when we were missionaries in Swaziland. One of the key components to our ministry was just having kids over for meals, and sometimes just for cookies. Jen's famous chocolate chip cookies. And you know, after over two years of living there in Swaziland, now called Iswatini, my wife was struggling a little bit. She kind of felt like she hadn't really done enough. Well, first of all, being married to me, that's more than anyone should have to put up with. But then she had a baby halfway through our time there. But one of the comments we got over and over and over from kids and in notes, in thank you notes, when we left, uh, and the last time we saw most of these kids, one of the things that came up over and over was, how much they loved hanging out at our house and how much they loved Jen's chocolate chip cookies. See, there is something powerful that takes place when people live in community, when people live in deep, meaningful friendships with one another. Let me give you a couple examples. And uh, I shared this study that I heard on an NPR program several years ago, but it's, it's worth repeating. This was a study done on rats and chemical dependency. 
The first study, they put in a rat, and that rat had two options. It could either drink from water or water that was laced with heroin. And the rat would always quickly become addicted and die of an overdose. But then they did a second study, and in the second study, instead of putting a rat by itself, they would put this rat in a community with other rats. And so all these rats, which lived together, have still had the same two options, water or water laced with heroin. And it was amazing to see what happened. Not one rat died or even got addicted to the heroin. And then I love this quote, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. See, we are born with a need to bond, and we will bond with something or someone, whether it's drugs, whether it's porn, or whether it's unhealthy, toxic relationships. Another study was done on people who survived trauma. And psychologists and sociologists have been uh, wondering uh, for years at why some people who uh, experience the same tra traumatic event, and yet some people overcome that and even benefit and grow from it while some get stuck and never get past the trauma that they experienced. And what they came down to, after all the research and all the study, um, was one factor, one critical factor made the difference between overcoming trauma or being stuck or even crushed by it for the rest of your life. And that one factor was that they lived in community. They had people, they had friends, they had family, that they could talk with and process the pain with in their lives. They had support groups, people who loved them, people who listened to them. It's one of the reasons I love Celebrate Recovery. It's one of the reasons I love Alcoholics Anonymous is because they get this. They understand how critical and how important human connection and human, human bonding is to overcoming whatever addiction, whatever hang-up that they have in their lives. At Boulder Creek Community Church, here's what we call it, Bible study. We call it getting together in groups of people where we talk about the scriptures, but we don't just talk about the scriptures, we talk about our lives. We talk about what God is doing in our lives. We talk about what we're struggling with. We talk about where we're afraid, where we're anxious. And we get the help and we get the support and we get the encouragement. And by the way, we sometimes get the correction that we need in life. I want to remind you that beginning the week of October 19th, we are going to relaunch men's and women's Bible studies. And I am hoping that we will also that week launch maybe an online study, maybe a mixed a men's and women's group and celebrate recovery as well. And so please contact me if you are interested in being a part of any uh, group uh, that has a culture that I'm talking about where you can not only be, but you can belong. And by the way, not only will you belong, you will begin to become not only the person that God wants you to be, but the person that you deep down really want to be. Let me close with this scripture, uh, uh, Revelations chapter 3, verse 20. This is what John uh, records hearing from Jesus. These are the words of Jesus. Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. And I will dine with him and he with me. And so the invitation of Jesus to you and me is to open the door. When Jesus says he wants to have a meal with us, what he's saying is, is he wants to have a friendship. He wants us to dine with him. And so my question for you is, have you opened the door to Jesus? By the way, this in context, in Revelation, is an invitation to Christians. 
But it's also an invitation to someone who has not yet surrendered their life to Jesus. Did you know that Jesus is standing at the door of your heart and he's knocking? Jesus is a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on anyone. But you have to open the door. You have to accept the invitation and welcome him into your life. Which is a life with Jesus. But don't forget, it's a life with others. God bless you guys. Thank you for hanging in there to the end of this message. Let me leave you with a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. God bless you guys. I hope to see you next time.